um, Brittany is a master's level social worker, earning both her graduate and undergraduate degrees in social work from Wagner University. Um, she has over 15 years of experience working with children and families in various roles, community-based social worker, behavior specialist consultant, mobile therapist, multi-systemic therapist, and lead clinician. She currently is the supervisor of the High Fidelity Wraparound Program at the Child Guidance Resource Center, as well as an outpatient therapist. She's committed to the day-to-day -day work she does with compassion and understanding. She works with each child and family to help them build on strengths and to attain goals they are committed to accomplishing. Welcome, Shay. Next, we have Dr. Nalene Lai, a practice medical director at Children's Hospital, Philadelphia, primary care in Doylestown, Bucks County. She's the co-host of the popular pediatric advice blog, Two Pets in a Pod, uh, and a frequent contributor to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Health Tip of the Week. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Dr. Julie Cardos, Medical Director of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Primary Care Network in Newtown, Bucks County. Uh, she has worked as a pediatrician in Bucks County, PA, for the past 25 years. Welcome. And uh, she is the proud parent of three adult children and a teenage American bulldog. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, we have Mike McKetty, uh, who began his career first as uh, in the Delaware County Juvenile Court System, supervising the community service program, and uh, then moved on to a 17-year career as a guidance counselor in Drexel Hill Middle School. Uh, Mike retired a couple of years ago, and we are fortunate here at the library to have him now as a member of our um, circulation staff. So welcome. Thanks. So we have a great array of expertise and experience, um, hopefully to help us um, handle these challenging uh, questions that we're going to uh, tackle this evening. So the first question for any one of our panelists is, one strategy that parents use often when there is a bad and disturbing news, right, is to either turn off televisions um, and media entirely, or mute the televisions when the children are in the room. And we wonder, what are your thoughts on those two strategies? Should children kind of just not be exposed? So depending on the age of the child, that is a very good strategy, I think. Even for adults, being bombarded with the same bad news all day can be really disrupting. But young children don't have context and experience. And so I think for young children, we're talking like preschool, elementary school, um, even it comes to middle school, you don't need to have it on all the time. No one really should have it on all the time. But I think telling your children in your own words if they've heard about these events, then you explain to the age of the child. You know, and and you kind of just give a very a very basic explanation, and then you wait to see what questions you get, mm -hmm. right? All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else on? Just make sure your mic's on too. Okay. okay. So tagging so on to that, um, it's so important for the kids to see structure in their lives. So, you know, we always talk about being us pediatrician, talk about the essentials of life being for a kid, eat, sleep, drink, eat, poop, and, you know, for adults too, as well as, you know, love. So good relationships with friends and family and, and learning for that. That's, that's their work. So if you do have this constant um, screen that is on in the background distracting your family from doing those, um, things, then um, then we're doing a disservice to our children. Okay, thank you. So, so let's say we turned off the screens. However, um, our child understands that something very disturbing or distressing has happened. Can any of you offer some 
words or gestures um, of reassurance and comfort to children that parents might be able to use? I think one of the most important things um, when trying to provide comfort to your child in terms of um, bad news or whatever the message might be, um, reassuring words is middle age. You know, so not, you know, it's okay to be you know, a hurt or it's okay. You know, I think one of the things is important to acknowledge their feelings, but also acknowledge their feelings with their child. Um, I think that comforting words, putting, getting hugs, right? It, it, it's just, you know, giving hugs. I remember just a few weeks ago, my daughter was having a really tough time about whether or not she was going to make the volleyball team. And she just needed a hug. She didn't want any words from me. She just needed a hug. And I just turned around and I gave her a hug. Right. Um, sometimes we can miss those cues if we're busy. You know, we all are trying to get dinner together when we come home. But sometimes she just sat there and she sat next to me and she kind of rushed up against me. I was like, Jesus. And so um, I just reached out and I embraced her. Um, it wasn't necessarily a conversation in that moment, but it helped her give reassurance that it's okay. And I think sometimes we can maybe give too many words that turn into a lecture and I've been here as a parent, right? You know, it's going to be okay. You know, if you don't make the team, you know, it's okay. And that's, she knows that. And she doesn't want to hear that in that moment, right? So I think um, sometimes just being present is important um, in terms of just being able, to, being able to offer those gestures and words. So. Mm -hmm. And I was going to build on the, you know, what do you say to your children if you are upset about the news that you're hearing? Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say to even your children, oh, you know, mom is sad because I heard some bad news. They might not ask, what is it? They, they want to know why you're sad. So it's hard to hide emotions from your children. They pick up on them anyway, and then they tend to think it's about them. So you can say, no, I'm sad because this happened to somebody else, or I'm sad because this you know, whatever the situation is, but I'm sad because of this you know, accident that happened, or I'm sad because of But you don't want to take too much, you want to let them ask. So they, they're only going to want to know what they want to know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay to, to tell your children that you're upset, or that you're worried, or that you're sad about something. And it, and you can say just enough that they know it's not them. That's one thing you should go to that So you're, I hear you saying that you really let the child be yeah. your guide in terms of. What you're what you're going to say, or how you're going to respond to that thing. And um, building on that, also, it's good many times to answer a question with a question. So if someone says, "Dad, um, why? What is happening? Why? Why are all these adults crying? What? What, what is happening?" Um, it, it's okay to say, "Why do you think that's happening? Or do you? What do you know about?" Um, because that really helps you understand where your kid's at. Again, when we give information, it can be too much information. As Jay was saying, sometimes they don't want that. The only thing I would add is I think children of all ages are sponges. They don't miss anything, even if they don't witness the event or see it on television. They pick up the emotions of the house. Um, I know this working in Catherine Middle School. They watch everything. They watch the relationships between the adults, how teachers get along. <clears throat> so they, and at any age, like, again, they pick up on the environment. So even if they don't say anything to them, they'll pick up maybe on the tenseness. Uh, they, again, they don't, uh, whatever age they are, they're, they're going to pick up on something. So I, think, I agree. It's good to acknowledge it to the level you think that they can understand. Certainly acknowledge it with your feelings. What mm -hmm. time is it? But, uh, I think you do have to screen certain things for certain reasons. But, uh, mm -hmm. but again, they pick up on it. Shay, if I could follow up um, on the comment that you just made. So you were, you were really intuitive with your daughter and you understood just by her body language and her interaction with you that she really didn't need to hear a lecture about how it's okay to don't make a team, but she did need to have. Is it, is it an effective strategy to say to children, tell me what you need now? Do you need me to just understand or do we need to talk about this? 
Absolutely. And I had to learn that balance as a therapist and social worker because mm -hmm. I'm automatically always in a problem solve mode, right? You know, like let's figure out the solution, right? Let's see where the solution focus. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that with my daughter is that she just wants to vent sometimes. She just wants to express her own thoughts, her own feelings. She doesn't necessarily need me to reassess for her or to correct her in that moment. And you know, once I was able to kind of learn that balance, our relationship in terms of communication was a lot better. Now she's like, oh, this book. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> I could definitely use me not to know that. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's good. And, and, and interestingly enough, um, recently she had a feeling over there, you took my mom all the way? And she's like, well, why not? Right? And But we had to grow there, definitely. Um, I think last year, um, coming out of the pandemic and going and leaving elementary school and going into middle school, it was a big adjustment. And we struggled a lot, right, in terms of me knowing how to meet her needs and, and be there and be supportive. But I think it's okay to, to be able to put questions out there and say, do you need me to listen or do you need advice? And we often, and sometimes as parents, we want to protect our children. We want to guide them. We want to make sure that we send them out into this world, you know, as able citizens, right? But it sometimes they don't always need us to redirect and correct in that moment. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be silent and come back to it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's affirming their feelings mm -hmm. and acknowledging their, their feelings. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are condoning the behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Or you're not responsible necessarily to fix the problem. Right, right, right. Sometimes they, they know the answer. They just want to talk it out sometimes. And of course, she's older, my daughter's 13, right? So, you know, it looks a lot different when you're younger kids, you know, and I think that it's important. Kids can guide you too. Sometimes we think as parents that we have to be the expert and we have to know everything. And I think it's okay to show vulnerability to our children and be okay with saying, you know what, mommy? You know, like you were saying earlier, and that's okay, right? So just recognizing, you know, um, what your children need, and just asking those simple questions. What would you like mommy to do? You know, same thing with a, a two-year-old. If they fall down, every two-year-old doesn't want to be in need. So like, you know, acknowledging and saying, you know, what what can I do to help this people feel better? Right? Is it a kiss? It might be, depending on your child, right? Or it could be they want a Spider-Man, you know, band aid. It just really just depends on you know, your child, but it's okay to ask your child what they need. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I think some parents wonder about is, sometimes you do have to have the discussion, right? The hard discussion, the hard conversation. What are the steps you take to create a safe space for that, a space environment to have that kind of challenging conversation with the child? Really, any any moments um, that you can. The, the best way to have these tough conversations um, be it about sex, about um, anything that uh, might be difficult is when you're in the grocery store, in the car, just when you're one-on-one. -on -one. So it's important for parents to be able to be one-on-one -on -one, and it doesn't have to be when we wait to be one on one um, when we go to Disney. I'm going to take you off to Disney to have these great conversations. It can be um, in my waiting room in the doctor's office. <laughs> okay, in fact, that's a great place to start. And I um, can see that all the time, actually. Parents um, talking and enjoying their kids because interactions are so different when they're one on one. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel? Want to I would build on that that you kind of create you, you create a safe space all along. So you have family meal where you kind of discuss whatever is on your mind. Then your child knows like, oh, this is a this is a one setting that you talk to my parents for, you know. Um, and again, when you're driving your kids somewhere, like talk to them or or let them talk to you. It's amazing how much you can get from them in a car when they're not you're not looking directly at each other. They're both, but somehow they I the older kids just tell you all kinds of things in the car. I was sad that my kids got their permits because you know, they have a license and I didn't have to drive them anywhere. But, um, you know, just 
like if I don't like when I walk when I walk into an exam room and I see a parent on their phone and a kid on their switch or whatever, and, and like they could have been talking to each other. But if you have those sort of all along, then your child knows, oh, I can talk to you. Or sometimes you create, you know something on your child's mind, you create a situation. Let's go for a walk. Let's just go for a walk. Walking is great. Again, one on one, you're not directly looking each other's eyes. Sometimes that's less intimidating, even though your child should feel comfortable with you, but they might feel more comfortable talking about potentially embarrassing topics or hard topics if they don't have to look at you. But you're not right across the table. Or... Right, right. So sometimes that's better. Um, but again, it's really just free of distraction, right? So if you need to suddenly tell your child something, you know, a grandparent just passed away. Or you want it to be in a place like that they're already comfortable with in your house or in your, you know, when, when there are not a lot of distractions. But then allow them to have the space to, to give them the news. And they might meet you right away and need to keep talking, or they might be like, oh, and then they need to get up and go. But it has to be, if you're in your house, you can get up and go in a safe place. Yeah. I would agree with that. I I think the big thing is to kind of get out of the environment you're used to, and maybe like I take walks. Uh, I have two boys, both in their twenties, both still at home, and both um, still need to be emotionally uh, attached to this so be part of their lives. So I like to take walks. We'll do something different, and I also like to go off topic. Um, that's one of the things I would do at school a lot. Is it's a completely different thing because at school you're not emotionally tied in that situation. So I'm an expert at the school. At home, it's still like it's always a work in progress. Um, but still, even at home, I like to go off topic, and then you can kind of work your way back to it. Um, so yeah, I think from um, taking walks, getting out of the environment, and one more. I'm sorry, when you said go off topic, so you start a conversation about something else, yeah. and then gradually it's something that might be closely related, like you're saying, you want to have it. You're concerned about maybe an issue, and maybe not talk directly about that issue, but maybe talk kind of around it, bring up something, and kind of ask their feelings uh, about something, and then maybe work towards what you really want to talk to them about. Because uh, usually, if you ask direct questions, um, it's not what you're going to get pretty much yes or no answers mm -hmm. for the most part. So it's really just engaging in the conversation, and the discussion. Okay. Um, you really can do that at any age. Great. Sure, you want to? Sure, I just want to piggyback um, just in terms of creating that safe space, um, particularly when it comes to those hard or difficult conversations. I think it's important to have that open dialogue prior to, right? So, creating a safe space would be, um, like Mike said, um, those are our questions you're not going to get an answer to, right? So, simple open ended questions to try to find out about your child's day. What was on lunch menu today? What did you like on the lunch menu today? Those are like, I, those questions just inspire her. It's like, you know, I don't like the lunch. And then she goes, you know, into what it is that she hated about that particular day. But then it just allows your child to, to know that you're there for them at any point, right? And that um, creating an environment just on topics that are not so difficult, when difficult conversations do have to happen, they'll be safe to be able to go if you come to you and have those conversations. But I, I agree with Mike, just trying to create everyday dialogue. And I know um, being a parent of a 15 year old, 16, 14 year old is a huge challenge, right? We're realizing more less of her when I still with us and she has a social life, you know? So again, silly questions, just like I said, like, who's in the lunch room today? Or who sat next to you at the, in the lunchroom, right? Um, or how about that assignment? What did Linda say about the question? You know, that you found like, challenging or difficult. So just trying to establish um, rapport. You know, I know it sounds weird, rapport with your child, but you know, once they're school age, they start to go out into the world and they start to develop own views outside of what you have presented. You're no longer the only influencer, right? So just being there, connecting with them, I think, um, and not so on those light topics, when those difficult topics come up, you'll be able to. Um, they'll be able to come to you if that makes sense. One uh, safe space that parents forget that they create every single day from minute one is that sleep routine. Um, because people 
people forget. That's where we support our kids and let them know that it's okay to let go of the day, that they have permission to let go of the day. And um, by setting that up, then parents later on when they are faced with an adverse event um, can face it better. Um, books, you know, we're in the library, so we know that books are a very important um, part of most people's bedtime routines. And while reading the book great um, as you fall asleep is not a great idea for one thing, it keeps going ahead. And, you know, we all know that as adults, right? Um, so you really, um, but early on, um, you can use the books. And I'm hoping that um, Mary Bear has some resources that she can put on the YouTube channel um, for different ages. But there are so many um, the feeling, you know, feeling books um, that you can parents can use to bounce ideas off um, on a consistent basis. So when they're faced with something, grab that favorite book. If one of the questions I would routinely ask students that would come in, uh, and they would come in quite a bit for a lot of different reasons, sometimes just to get out of class. That's why you pick up on that. I would always ask them, when you, who do you talk to? Like, who can you share these things with outside of speaking to me? Like, who do you go to? And when I would get an answer of, of my mother or my father or my parent, or somebody in the family, I always thought that was the healthiest one. And I would encourage that. And I said, well, that's good. Because I always thought it was very important that the first person they could share would be uh, a family member. I thought that was Kind of nice, and I'm trying to encourage that. Can I ask what, what if you didn't get parents to respond to you? Uh, I probably did explore a whole lot more, just kind of see what they had to say, and then we would just continue our discussion. Um, but I, would, I think a lot of times the students were intimidated by talking to parents as part of that. And sometimes I would say you could, that you could talk with them, how do you feel about talking to them? And, um, they sometimes uh, they were reluctant, but I would also say I'd be happy to, like if you want me to, if you want to call your parent, I would be here. Or I would call the parent um, and sometimes just kind of say their child, you know, there's somebody who he or she has something that they want to tell you. So trying to support them as much as I could, but. I mean, they have to be comfortable to be share one, so I thought uh, whatever direction they want to go. We actually do that, you know, not often, but when there's a hard topic, we offer to the team in particular. Would you, um, would you, uh, would you like us to get my help in sharing this piece of information with your parents? At this age, especially middle school age, right, when peers become primary, right, it is hard to get them to begin to retain their trust, right? And when it is a difficult thing, they don't want to get their friends in trouble, right? And that becomes a real important driver. So just to recap, because there's so much good advice here. In general, right, the, the best case scenario is you've already established safe. Um, safe spaces for your family to communicate with one another. But we heard um, environments where you're not eye to eye, walks, car, waiting room in the doctor's office. Um, and the open-ended questions, Shay, I love your examples, right? Because so many parents say, how was your day? Good. <laughs> Did you learn anything? No. Um, but what did you like on the lunch menu? Or who sat next to you today? Or um, really just opens the door, as Mike said, kind of starting with a less threatening question, right? A less uncomfortable question, and then moving into uh, the topic they really want to talk about or need to talk about. So that was great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, given the season we're in right now, mid October, um, we're all well aware if we have watched television at all that this is um, election time. Uh, and so politics, politics. Uh, when is it appropriate to share 
political ideas, political thoughts with your child. How old should your children be before you begin having discussions about politics? I think particularly at a time like this, where if your family ever has a television on, right, they're kind of bombarded with um, many, many different kinds of political messages. <laughs> the old adage, no one wants to talk about politics, right? <laughs> I think that it kind of, I think children are interested in their parents' opinions, mm -hmm. and as they get older, like you know, or high school, they may not admit to being interested in their opinion, but they still are. And what they do is, as long as you're expressing your opinion as your opinion, and you can explain why you feel the way you do, then those kids go to their friends, and they they are checking each other out, like, and but they're using your opinion. And they're kind of feeling out their friends, and that's how they're forming their own opinions. So I don't think there's anything wrong. If mm -hmm. your child's interested, you can explain how voting works and all that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, even elementary school have election for the solution in the class right. or whatever. Right. But, um, you know, you can explain like what characteristics do you think make a good leader, like what characteristics do you think, you know, what are you looking for? in a leader and um and then children will take your and then again children will take your opinion and then they'll kind of mull it over and they'll think they might pull their eyes at you when you're but they're also here too and then they might you know, several days later you might get a question based on what you have talked about a few days before so again that goes back into the continue to have those safe spaces around because that's when they may voluntarily continue the conversation we're having about how Great, thank you. Just to piggyback, I, I totally agree. And I think, again, this is a, a discussion or a topic where, like you said, Margaret, a lot of people are like, no, don't talk about it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I do think allow your children to guide the conversation, see what they know, right? Um, don't run away from the questions because a lot of times they're just looking for clarity. They're just looking for a clarification, right? And so allow them to, you know, maybe there is a commercial that came on or ad that came up and they have a question, you know, allow them to guide the conversation. Or if you have an older child and you want to have that conversation, then utilize that opportunity in the moment to talk about it. Like, hey, what do you think about that commercial? What do you think about, you know, that idea? Um, try to break it down to levels that they understand. Um, in middle school, they start doing student government. Right, and advocating for themselves, and you know, um, talking about different things they'd like to see um, in their schools, right? Um, so, meet your child where they are. Sometimes I think we try to recreate that will sometimes, and we're more uncomfortable than our kids really are, right? <laughs> so, I was just gonna add uh, one other comment teach your children that you all have to agree with each other, and you can still like each other. So now, especially, you know, it never was like this, but you know, I can't be friends with this person because of how they voted. You can at least model, but you, you can't be friends with a person that doesn't vote the way you vote. Um, and that you can have a discussion that even if say, two parents are disagreeing with who they're going to vote for, be calm in front of your child and explain, you know, and, and just show them. Doesn't, you know, just because we don't politically agree doesn't mean you can't like each other, can't love each other. Right. So, so that's important. really important to model. Right. That's so important. I think just the old age that will be kind, right? And, you know, we don't have to agree, like you said, on everything. And that is okay. That's that's healthy, that's appropriate. Um, but just be kind to one another, you know, and um, we can uh, you know, agree to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> and be okay. And we can still sit together at lunch. <laughs> and really, it's just an, another reminder that your children aren't you. They, they aren't. I remember so vividly. Being so excited to read, um, it was it was actually the Narnia books <laughs> to, to my kids. I loved them. I adored them growing up, and they said, "Mom, that's not real." I, I said, "What do you mean? <laughs> I love these." And so again, they're just not you. Politics are yeah, right, right. Might be anything to add. I would say when you go home tonight and you watch the 76ers game or the Phillies game, <laughs> look at the commercials. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing I uh, usually any sport I watch that DVR, so I never watch it live because it takes up that night. 
But if you watch the commercials during during anything, during any kind of television, some of them are right over the sectional, and right now there's a lot of political commercials on both sides. That children three, four, five, six, seven years of age are watching the sporting event or being exposed to them. So they're probably not going to have questions. But if you, if I always tried to watch TV from the perspective of my child, and some of it would be pretty overwhelming mm -hmm. some of the things I can see. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to be aware <clears throat> of what your child is watching, especially during the commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, the commercials now are pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike just made a very good point, which is you need to know where your child is developmentally. You know, I always say those one year old, two year olds, the three puppy dog stage, it's like here and now. Um, and you know, as you get older, you, um, your, your, your sense of time changes, your sense of your peers changes. There's a lot that goes on developmentally. So, and there are plenty of people um, that you can reach out to. You know, school, school being one. I mean, of course, you come to the doctors. <laughs> we do, but that's what we do all day development. But um, there are plenty of people to kind of ground you. But as you said, you could, going to the doctor it feels for I think for lots of families like such a safe and kind of neutral space. Right? It can be a wonderful resource um, when you say to your child, "Can I help you talk with your parent about?" Okay, sometimes that works at school, um, but uh, it's another another terrific resource. Okay, so two really tough topics, not current affairs, but really difficult topics that parents struggle with, right? Um, at what age or when developmentally do you talk with your child about death or sex? Pick one anyone. So I know when I um, used to do therapy with younger kids, right now a lot of my practice is you know, that I do work with kids, kids, older kids, teenagers. But when I work with a lot of the younger children, I would start with books, right? And, you know, especially if a parent approached me and said, you know, um, unfortunately we said they didn't know that they had to like, um, we really want to address this in therapy. Um, and I would start with books, and I can definitely share. There's a book that I, I would share with my younger kids about. It, it talked about it in terms of dinosaur, but um, it was a, I can't remember the name of the title, um, and I was trying to look for it before I came here this evening, and I couldn't find it um, in my bookcase. But I, I, I'm a big component and advocate of starting with books to generate the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then allow again on the big component allowing the child to guide the conversation because um you don't want to overload them with information they might not be looking for all that they might just be asked, just be curious about this aspect of it so just starting where the child is and starting where they are is very important i think and i would say it's never too early to talk about the topic it's as it comes up right so um, you know, I mean, death is part of life, and and you know, it's like step on an ant, so they can't just dead now, <laughs> right? I mean, but it comes up so early, and and like you were saying, knowing where the child is, um, and what they have questions about. So, my when my twins were four, their grandmother passed away, and so and we, we knew this was coming, so we said, you know, your grandma's sick. She's very fit, and the doctor is doing what they can. We kind of led them into it, and but then we had to tell them that she had died. And so we said, you know, I'm not die. And it was so interesting because one said, oh, and then he went and started playing. And the other one had, where was she when she died? What, why did she die? What, I want, was she in her, and she, she was in the hospital, and she died at home. You know, she was in her bedroom. I want to see her bedroom. I want to see her bed. Like, and she's been there many, many times. You can visualize it when you had to go see it. So different kids, even at the same age, have different needs. And and then he was he was okay after we had he had his renewal. <laughs> but it so you can't shy away from it, but you just say a few words and then you wait and see what comes next. Yeah. Did your other child Come back around at any point, he even, really in, even in a different way. Not really. He didn't no. really talk much, and then sometimes he would forget, and then we remind him, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. he wasn't. 
he didn't show as much like because you know in some children three four five they don't know that this for always so sometimes they need reminders um and they don't need a big long explanation why why did she die because her body stopped working if he was old she was sick if you get the well i died well, everybody, everybody died, but you won't die for a very long time. And this is where when you have very young kids, you can be absolute. You don't have to be wishy much. You was a three, four, five year old, or even mm -hmm. a two year old old enough, they don't tend to ask as many questions. They can't quite developmentally get there. But a three, four, five year old will ask you, and they just need to know that you will be there and that you will, you know, like if, if you know, I will be here for you, mm -hmm. you know, will this happen not for a long time? Of course, you don't do that, but you mm -hmm. have to say it to a little kid right. because mm -hmm. it's really, if you're wrong, they're not gonna know. I mean, <laughs> honestly, so you can start to I mean, yes. it's not wrong, but some people, I hear parents sometimes kind of stepping around it. Just be absolute to a very young child, they need to hear absolute. So you mean a parent might say, not for a very long time, probably, or if Yeah, or I don't know, but we hope it's not for, yeah, mm -hmm. no, just say, so, no, not for a long You're time. safe, I'm safe, yes. you're okay. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I, I get um, the yearly year I get from all kids is fire prevention week. Mm -hmm. This no pediatrician is talking about. It's this time. Um, but, but it's scary <laughs> for the little children, right? The whole yes. fire prevention week. And I, I, I coach parents of really little kids. You know, they'll say, but what if I can't get to the meeting place? And what if I can't get out of my room? And your answer is, we will get you out of your room. We will save you. We will get you to the meeting place. Like just say it. It will be okay. Yeah. 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 And um, piggybacking on that, you do you want to be very clear at all ages and use the real words. Um, you can't say that um, grandma is sleeping. Grandma is not sleeping, and they will fear sleep uh, at all ages. Um, you can't. It's very dangerous, actually, if you're talking about um, anatomy. Um, and you're not using the actual words. There are some cases where kids have not been taught the proper anatomical words. And, um, and because they're using a euphemism, um, people don't recognize it as child abuse or something inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So you really do need to be very careful. Plus, really, um, you really want to be on the same page as everybody. With you know, whether it's your physician, your teachers, um, so it is very important. Julie, just to illustrate your point, um, this is, of course, fire prevention season. So, in our school, of course, we've already had two drills because we know the fire trucks will be pulling up any day now. Um, and last week, as the children were turning back to the building, they had been told, right. They were turning back, and the three-year-olds were toddling in, and one little guy had his head down, but I heard him saying, this was a drill, this was a drill, this was a drill, right? He was soothing himself from all of that anxiety, um, and sometimes we forget, you know, we're just have a stopwatch and get them out and get them in and no talking, um, but for a little, a little one, it can be a real fear. Want anything to add? On the topic of when to speak to children about death or how to? Well, I was just trying to think about what the one said. I mean, it's, I think that's the concrete. I mean, I mean, I mean, oh, as it is, but not to come back to this kind of story. But I'm not going to that. I'm going to look at that. I think everybody said. And, and they can feel how they feel, right? Like my own children. I didn't say, well, aren't you sad? No, but mm -hmm. they, you, know, you let them feel what they feel. And you, and if you are crying, giving the news, you can, it's okay. You know, I'm very sad about this. That's why, that's why I'm crying. Mm -hmm. and, and that teaches your children, you're allowed to feel emotion and show emotion. Sure. And, and um, but you don't have to dictate how they're going to feel mm -hmm. or how they show their emotion. Mm -hmm. Thank I would like to piggyback with Julie. I think that's very important um, to not project our own feelings onto our children. And I keep saying it just resonated with me um, when my father in law passed away. Um, my husband and I we were, you know, seven, seven, and my daughter at the time she was seven. And she said, Okay, mommy, 
And you know, it, it, I acknowledge her feelings, but I didn't give a short to say, well, you should be resigned. And said, Are you sure you want to say? You know, in that moment, that's how she felt. Now, years later, as she's older, you know, she starts to have these different sets of emotions that kind of deal with that and we process and talk it out. But I just remember in that moment, it was just appropriate for, for her to feel her way and for me to feel my way and be vulnerable and not feel afraid to show her that I was sad in the moment. And you know, I acknowledge it, like, you know, we're right, mommy and daddy will be okay. We're just that in a moment because we're going to But not pushing our own feelings onto her, you know, once her. So and I, I do want to um, recognize, especially in my role as a trustee here, that books are good tools, right? <laughs> um, age appropriate books. Um, and there are so many on um on difficult topics that can be the gateway conversation. Yes, and to, if you don't know how to explain something, let a book do it. You know, mm -hmm. it be and mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's easier to hear some people than others. It's just a personality. So right. there are books for almost every topic. Right. So that's a good segue into the other topic that I asked you to talk about, but everyone avoided. And that, <laughs> and that was um, that was a topic of sex, right? And so many, right, there are many, many funny scenes in movies, right, where parents just hand the book to, to the child um, instead of having the conversation. And books certainly can be terribly important and valuable, but how else do we have these conversations with our children? I, I think Mike actually you know, hit, hit it earlier when he was talking about um, the, the advertisements on TV and um, mm -hmm. right there is a conversation starting points. Um, but also even letting kids be aware that different age children mm -hmm. that you're hitting people people look different over time. And how do you think you'll get there is a, um, a nice gateway opening for a lot of kids when they're um, just starting. Mm -hmm. But um, the nice thing I have noticed is that kids are just much more open, which is really <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as much as social media gets a lot of knocks, um, they, they're just not as concerned as much about how they look always. <laughs> so, um, so that there are some nice things about going into adolescence. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of it depends on your own comfort level. Uh, so, I know if I order some, I have a talk in about five, six years ago. I'm probably going to have that talk. <laughs> so it yeah, really depends on how we talk to my staff to see and kind of try to figure it out. But like I was given a book and I was trying to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> so I did try to have a talk with my older son. And like I said, it's now time to do it. So but at least I attended. But I think it really depends on your comfort level. Right. So did you not have to talk with your younger son or did you rely on your older son's have a conversation? That was my wife's turn. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, you have the opportunity as parents to teach your children, just like in politics, like how do you feel about sex? Like you can say that with love, like that, that, you know, when people love each other, but you, you can, it's okay to, Again, give your opinion. Why is it appropriate? Why is it, you know, um, you know, and then for little kids, it, it's all about, you know, like little like young and toddler, you know, if you're having a second baby, you know, have a baby get there and all that, that might be to a conversation about like kind of mechanics and how you <laughs> but again, it's what the child asks, you know. And a lot of kids will ask questions and you kind of answer them, and then like a couple a year later, they ask you the same question. Because you know, if, if you don't get all Money about it. It's just like when they ask you how come the leaves turn color. Like it doesn't have to be an emotionally loaded, you know, conversation. And and like if you get they ask you the same question more than once. So it's just what they ask you when you just give them what they need to know and then they might ask they might build a question on that. Mm -hmm. Um I remember my older one when he was seven, I was surprised he never asked anything. And then literally in the car by him dropping off the twins to his second grade class asked me every question that follows every question and to the oh my god really and like all the and then I drop them off at school and I'm thinking hmm I wonder what he's going to teach his second grade class <laughs> 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 but, but, but then I get asked the same question a year later so they don't you know <laughs> um, 
have to say. Uh, and that's so true. I think you just have to realize what their every child is different, right? And sometimes when they ask the question, we're getting all uncomfortable with ourselves and we are anticipating this to be a lot worse. And honestly, again, it's them guiding the conversation. I remember I was really small and we uh, were watching, I don't know, Disney something, a Disney book, or watching a Disney movie. And I remember I said, you know what they do on a honeymoon, right? And she's like, stay home here. <laughs> So it's like, I was like, what am I doing? You know, like, sure. but that was her response. And so immediately I felt so uncomfortable because she's so small. And, but it was so simple and so cute. Like, come on, they finally get the whole penis. And we cracked up and we laughed. It was so funny because we were so serious and like overcritical of ourselves. And we kept looking at each other. <laughs> she's like, they hold hands. Silly. The only opportunity for the next time. Right. <laughs> but it was so simple. Like, they hold hands. And I'm like, ah, okay. And, and at that time, it just wasn't appropriate to have that conversation. And nor was she looking for that conversation, right? So. <laughs> The other thing is, again, we're talking about books again. <laughs> you know, let's face it, as parents, we don't know everything. Why would we know everything? But there are people that do, so you can, you know, go. There are no recommendations for specific books. There are, um, you know, again, your positions. <laughs> um, there are many other resources. And I think sometimes, I think as parents, we really feel this burden <laughs> to do right. everything all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And we should probably distinguish, right, again, age appropriate, but are we talking about, you know, what happens to our bodies, are we talking about body parts, or are we talking about relationships, sexual relationships, and, and those are very different um, and require very different kinds of conversations, right? And, you know, the, the old cliche is the talk, right? But I suspect it's just like our earlier conversations, right? It, it needs to be kind of an ongoing part of your relationship and your communication with your families, right? So that it's not one day, one talk, and we never talk about it again, um, or it becomes family legend. <laughs> um, okay. Anyone else want to um, share about those conversations? Margaret, you just brought up a really good point in terms of it not feeling like a burden because it's one conversation like you just said, right? <laughs> this is your only opportunity. Um, and, and again, it really depends on what it is, the topic of it is, is it your body. Um, I literally remember finding a book in Five Below about the changes in a female body and a male body. And my daughter, she would come to me today and say, oh, you know, that makes sense. And, and we would talk about it just casually, right? Mm -hmm. You're right. Right. doing laundry. And just having a casual conversation, so not making it so intense where it's like, you know, an interrogation, right? And everyone's sweating to try to figure out what to say. It's just an ongoing conversation. And it allowed me, it gave me even more parents. I was like, wow, thankful that I had the book to kind of guide her. And then she would come back with questions, or she would just give me a comment and say, oh, that makes sense. And I was like, you know what, that makes sense, right? So, Again, it's not just one conversation, it's an ongoing thing like we talk about all evening, right? Mm -hmm. Just ongoing and having those, those different opportunities, whether you see something um, on TV or whether they heard something on the schoolyard, but that's important, right? Mm -hmm. um, break down those myths. You don't want <laughs> right. you know, you don't want your children to go around believing a certain thing and if it's not true, so maybe just saying, Well, you know, let's talk a little bit more about that. Right, because it doesn't exactly work that way. And then to take me back on your comment, you can do a do over with your kid. If you don't like the way a conversation went, or you're like, yeah, I was, you can tell your kid, you know, well, we're talking about that. I was thinking about it, and actually, or if you can, like, again, it's ongoing. So, right, it's not one opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But to that point, Shay, I think, you know, you were prepared. Right, you were thinking ahead, you were anticipating when your daughter's questions were going to begin to emerge. So, do any of you have guidance around appropriate ages? Understanding, of course, that each child is different and may, you know, may need to hear things at a different age, but 
we do want our children, right, in terms of their own development, physical development, not to be surprised what, when things happen, right? So are there, do you have guidelines that you use um, around the right times to begin these conversations with your children? Partner with our pediatrician, right? So that would have be a big factor for me, just sitting down in, you know, the pre adolescent stage, right? And, you know, her guiding me and saying, you know, you might be probably you might have this might happen, or you might see this. And so I utilize that as an opportunity for me to kind of store it and help me, you know, know that questions might happen and like what things look for in terms of health wise, you know, and changes in her body. So I, I partner with our pediatrician. <laughs> Wonderful advice, right? We, we spend a lot of time trying to <laughs> <laughs> Do you do you think as pediatricians, this is something I hear from families in in our school um, that um, puberty is advancing and and um, children are experiencing it at younger and younger ages, or is, is it, do you think that's just anecdotal? I mean, if you go back to 100 years ago, you know, we're, we're, we're better than her. So, yeah. so, so girls used to, like, not take a period until 14 or 15 because they weren't well nourished, and now they are. So it's not like the hormones in the cows or something. It, it, it's literally, it's just that they're healthier. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a lot of it. And I agree with, you always want to introduce, like, puberty-related topics before puberty happens. And if they're not interested, you just kind of throw out comments every now and then. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to have, we need to have a conversation. But again, when you're talking, when you're driving them somewhere, mm -hmm. you can make it come up if you see a commercial that triggers a comment, you know, a quick little comment, you know. Or, so sometimes it's better on little drips and drives, but you don't want them to be surprised. And in girls, getting a period is the end of puberty. So that you have, you do see other physical changes before that. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, but that is important to approach these things before they happen. I think when a lot of schools don't start much in the way of sex education until fifth grade, and that is too late. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm mindful of the time and wondering if we have questions from folks uh, on Zoom or folks who are here with us. First, I don't see anything in the chat here. Nothing in the chat. Okay. I have just a few more um, that we might want to talk about. This is uh, back to kind of adolescents, teenagers um, who, when difficult things happen, may be at the age where they really don't want to talk to you. They're really not, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of moved into that phase of, you know, independence and sometimes even kind of rebellion, right? But you have to have a difficult conversation. Perhaps something challenging is happening in your family or um, in your community. Um, any strategies to kind of break through and reach um, that particular age that where communication can really be challenging? Well, I think, I think communication has to be on its own. I don't think it's something that you can start at 13, 14, or 12. I think it starts when you're very young and having discussions with respect to your opinions. I found out uh, probably, it's, again, it's a totally different dynamic being a guidance counselor at school and then raising your own children. I mean, it's, it's not even, to me, there's a lot of parallels, but once you have that emotional involvement, that kind of changes everything. Um, but I think as far as little children, I think you have to always you have to respect their opinion. You have to give them instant knowledge of it to all you can give them and say, hey, come out with the decisions you make. I think when children are young, and I can speak for myself, it's probably you know, a lot of how we parent is based on how we were raised. So kind of raised them more like they're just kind of told to do things. And uh, I think as a parent, you have to step back as an examiner. Theoretically, how you approach your subjects. Um, okay, my, my thing is share with my children is only one thing to control, and that's yourself and how you approach things. So, again, somehow I think uh, you have to have that relationship uh, 
It's still touching down, but there are still so many things that, and getting back to uh, first kids that come in again at sixth grade in middle school, that they know everything, they've been exposed to everything because it's, it's out there, it's on their cell phones. It's, they know so much, and uh, it's overwhelming for them because they're all emotional and not ready to, uh, to understand a lot of what's going on. Anyway, so that to me, that just emphasizes how important that is the relationship. So, so avoiding that kind of wall that goes up if you build a good foundation before teenage years. For sure. Yeah, I think that's a start for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of hard. If you don't have that relationship, you probably only going to get so far. Mm -hmm. Even with that relationship, it's a constant challenge. Mm -hmm. My one son, we were talking about this program tonight, he said, well, I have to talk for 13. You really don't need to be telling me anything. <laughs> <laughs> like everything's already formed and, and you're right, you're making your own decisions. So, so much of our work is done so early when probably a pretty stressful time for us as parents. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was going to add that when children look like adults, they're not adults, right? So, if some kids go to puberty early and it's 13, 14, and it's like they're 20 and 21, but they're still kids, their brains are still developing. You don't think kids' brains fully, fully develop until somewhere between 20 and 25. So that's why they're more prone to like addiction, for example, like drug addiction, their brains are not fully developed. You know? And um, I think that even the kids who seem like they have super close relationships with their parents then go through that all of a sudden. They're always behind their closed door bedroom and they don't want to do things with their family, they want to be with their friends. But they're still, if they've always, if you've always had like rituals, we all eat together or we all do, you know, take family trips or just on a family walk on the week, whatever that is that you set up, keep doing it. And don't assume just because they look like grown up, they, they don't, they, they're still paying attention to what you're saying. So you might not have to talk directly to them, but have a conversation. You can even plan your dinner conversation with your spouse and know that you're going to stop those. But I, I would, you know, I see so many different situations at work as a pediatrician, and I can change ages and completely decide who I'm talking about. I would never talk about a specific patient with my family, but I can say, hi, you know, there's a situation, and I'm just wondering what you would do if you were in that situation. And I get these kind of, you know, I, I get the basic story, but I don't to get that from, you know. But, um, so they're still listening to you, even if they're not necessarily acknowledging you. And I think also, just, again, we be careful to let you come out your thinking, this is what I think. <laughs> it's okay that, you know, they don't think. And um, I just know that sometimes they, just like little kids, sometimes react to something several days later, even big kids do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And, and it still goes back to way back in toddlerhood where you let them fall down sometimes. It's okay. And you tell them it's fine. But if it's going to be permanent, if they're really going to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else, no, that, that can't happen. Um, and that is when you actually go up to the room and you knock on the door instead of texting them, which I actually found really convenient. <laughs> I want to sell it, right? <laughs> because it was easier because I got so tired of having to go up and down the so much. Um, but that's when you truly, you know, you, you break open the door and you go in um, because it really is important. Um, I just have, a, I had a note on chats. Uh, one of our participants said regarding the sex talk, uh, not a question, but Corey Silverberg has a great book trilogy. One is for the littles. Uh, book two is for ages eight through 10. And book three is for 10, ages 10 plus. They're well-written, LGBT plus inclusive, great for conversation starters, as well as reading alone. So, and we do have it in the catalog. <laughs> Jay, did you want to? Sure. I was just wondering your thoughts. Yeah, just adding around the discussion with those teenagers, right, in those teenage years where 
the appear a lot uh, harder on the outside than the inside. And um, Julie brings a good point. Just because they have grown in size does not mean that they don't need our affection or our encouragement. And I, I remember, you know, a big piece of me as a parent when I try to connect with my daughter as a teenager, I try to connect with her friends as well, right? So I'm, you know, at their volleyball game and I'm encouraging the kids and she's like, every day you come, you're so wow. I didn't do that, you're so embarrassing. And one day I came to the game, I didn't say anything. She came over to me and she said, what are you doing? She's like, the girls are lying on you. And I'm like, they are? <laughs> but it was like mixed signals, right? And so that, you know, it just kind of resonated with me, continue to show up, continue, even if they stay in the door, even if they shut the door, even if they say, I don't want to talk, even if they say, you know, uh, you don't understand, right? Just continuously show them that unconditional love and acceptance no matter what. And I think that's key is that unconditional acceptance. I don't love you because of what you do, what you achieve, or what kind of grade you get. I love you because you're my child. And I think that is important that they might not come to you that day, but two days later, maybe they are ready to talk and maybe they are ready to have that conversation. But again, just being there, even if they are not reciprocating what we remember as toddlers, right? Those snuggles and those hugs and you know, all of those things that we like as parents to make us feel good. That doesn't make us feel good if we get endorsement in our kids. But we were like a self person. Right? <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> you know, just to be able to provide that support to them and letting them know. Um, but then there are times where you have to have those difficult conversations, right? And text, I can admit it has been convenient for me, you know, my teenager, but there are times where it's not appropriate for text and I need to go upstairs and I need to say, hey, can we talk about this? So, okay, thank you. Um, I think there's one last question that you know any of you might want to share. Are there topics, and again, this depends on the age, are there topics that you would say to parents right now are off limits, not necessary, should not talk to children about? Well, I would probably say you no, know, because I don't believe in absolutes. It depends on how to do it, and I think. Something the child wants to talk about, or you think it's something that you need to talk about, I think you should. The only other thing I wanted to point out is, uh, or just kind of say, is if there's an opportunity to see your child like in a different kind of setting, or sports setting, I always like to, when I was at school, I'd go in the classroom, I'd go in the gym, which is a different kind of person who comes in your office. It's like they're coming in the school, so you might see maybe something manufactured. But if the opportunity arises to see, Children uh, in your environment and social setting is really kind of interesting. But then you see a whole different side of that. You see them more important. That's a little bit of a No, thank you. Good advice, of course. I guess when I ask the, the question about, you know, your topics off limits, what I hear from parents in, in our school sometimes is the topic of school shootings. Mm -hmm. But it's just too difficult to talk about. It's just too hard and they would prefer to shield their child from knowing that such terrible things happen. There are schools that have these shooter drills, so I don't know how they every school does, right? Right? So sure. they know. I mean mm -hmm. they, they know. Mm -hmm. Um but I again I agree you don't have really use 24 7. Mm -hmm. Um and you know if it's a very young kid who knows what's going I, I, I don't know. I think it's a really, really little preschool. If they happen to hear about it, they think it won't happen here. This one happened. I think it's okay to say that for a really young child. Mm -hmm. um, after that, it's just kind of, I mean, I don't know. It, it is a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a child like conversation, though. Mm -hmm. like, I don't get to sit down your child and say, you know, it happened. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think they're going to hear about it, and we just need to be open to their questions and their worries. Um, I was going to say the topic of like what should you talk to your kids about. I can't think of any specific topic either. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a topic you just can't talk about, mm -hmm. just know who, who could. And you can tell your child, like, I, I either I don't know enough or I'm not comfortable with this, but I want you to have 
the conversation with someone, here's the person that, that can talk to you. Mm -hmm. So if you can't do it, you can't, but have no other grown up that can. No, great advice, because there are topics, of course, that we might find too difficult yeah. ourselves, right? Um, so with a very young child, you would say, don't worry about it. That's not going to happen here. I, do you have advice for the middle schooler or the high schooler who says, I'm afraid we had this drill today and what, what if it happens in our school? So, you know, I actually, I actually was going to um, address right before that, um, the, the concept of um, how do you explain things? And I actually often send parents back to their own therapists for their own um, support because you can um, get, well, here we are, right? <laughs> so we're talking, we're trying to give parents um, support so that they in turn can support their children. So, um, and I think people forget that. Um, now, in, in terms of school shooting, you know, the, there's a, that awful, I remember actually from being a kid <laughs> hearing once that at any point there's a war going on. There is a war going on with atrocities, it's a war, okay? Somewhere on the road, there's a war. There has not been a time um, where there hasn't been um, uh, fighting going on, okay? So, so really, in terms of things like shooting, things like that, you really want to ground the kids in the things they can do, right? Eat, sleep, drink, eat, sleep, love, learn, go do it, right? And do it again and again, get to sleep on time, wake up, and do it again, <laughs> okay? So um, I think if you're separating on any topic, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, you know, I mean, Shay knows from our kids that are very anxious, um, it can almost be anything. <laughs> so um, if it's interfering with those things, it's time to move to um, a different level. So moving on to professional help, if it's interfering right there. In other words, we don't need to, again, don't need to um, have a, we don't need to be the be on and off the parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. We um, I always say, you know, one of my jobs is to make a parent's life easier. Okay. And there are plenty of people in many mm -hmm. places and spaces that, that can do that. And increasing the wealth of resources around issues of mental health, social and emotional growth and development, right? Um, that parents Really can kind of deal themselves. Yeah. Jane, you want to have a final just, word here? Uh, just the final word in terms of like those difficult conversations. Um, and you, you bring up a really good point, and I said it earlier partnerships, right? Sometimes as parents, we already are carrying a lot on our shoulders. And sometimes it is, you know, easier to just say, it's okay to say, you know what, I don't have the answer to that right now, right? But I can definitely find someone who has the answer for you. Or, if you need to get support for yourself as a parent, I think that's important too. Mm -hmm. Is to acknowledge within ourselves um, how a certain issue or topic is affecting our own mental health and our our and our own ability to be able to kind of process that out um, before we kind of push it off on our children. And going back to what I said earlier, it's just allowing that child to you know guide that conversation. Of course, for the little or younger ones, in terms of school shooting, they might not necessarily be appropriate. But for these older kids, these teenage, these middle school kids, and teenage and high school schoolers, you have TikTok, you have social media that is played with personal opinions, mm -hmm. and that's the my gripe sometimes with social media is everyone has a platform, and so I sometimes just get into the facts, right? You can't possibly explain the reasoning on why a person does something. And that's okay to say, I don't know why that person did that. Because you don't have the answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can assume, you can, you can, um, you know, make assumptions, but you're not that person who committed that attack, right? So how can you answer for your child? So maybe just starting there and just stick into the facts of what it is, right? And acknowledging maybe their feelings, if there's feelings of unsafe, you know, feelings. I know my daughter's school, they have active shooter drills, and that has, you know, ignited a lot of conversations in our home. And really, I allow her to have a conversation. I, I can't even imagine how she feels. I don't remember having that when I was in school. There was fire drills, right? <laughs> and that was it. 
Um, but there is no, I mean, it, it broke my heart to hear some of the things you're doing in these, in these um, after shooting drills. But one of the things that I just kept saying is, I know that this might seem a lot, but this is what they're doing to ensure safety if something happens, right? So I just said, it, it's been right? If this happens, we can try this to ensure your safety. Right? Mommy and daddy at home are going to always be there to protect you. But when you're at school, we're not there. So it was, it was good to be able to talk to her. And even for her, it was talking about how the teachers felt, right? And the teachers being vulnerable and sharing their own thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. And acknowledging to my daughter that that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I guess while we've covered many different topics, there have been some common themes, right? One is from the beginning, from the earliest stages of parenting building those lines of communication, creating rituals, family rituals. So you built the safe space from the beginning, right? So as the topics become more and more challenging and more and more difficult, um, you created an environment where you, uh, you and your child uh, are honest with one another uh, and caring and kind. Uh, and that's the secret sauce, right? To, to getting through the more challenging um, pieces and of course, um, taking advantage of lots of resources online, in the doctor's office, in the therapist's office, and of course, in the library, and, and um, so many wonderful books that help us guide um, our children's experiences. So I want to, on behalf of the library and the adult school, really thank all four of you for your expertise and And thank you, Mary, for coordinating and um, getting this event uh, off the ground. And we will have resources that we're going to send to all registrants, um, uh, uh, online resources, and we'll also curate a list of books, too. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>